biggest news around the NFL currently is the Aaron Rodgers situation. Has he played his last down in Green Bay? We're going to get into that as far as the NFL draft goes. It's officially over. And we want to recap everything that went down. Which teams improved the most following the 2021 NFL draft? And who are some players that teams were able to draft at a very great value? We're going to have our buddy Jordan Thomas join us and give us his insight on which teams improved the most in the biggest draft steals. And speaking of the draft, the New Orleans Saints made some questionable decisions. Our buddy Sean Landry is a big Saints fan. He's going to be joining us later on in the show and giving us his insight on the Saints and their draft. All of that on a brand new episode of Time to Football. Glad you guys are joining us. My name is Hassan Khan, the host of the show. Wow, the NFL draft was amazing. And if you guys joined us for last week's episode of Time to Football, it was a little bit different. It was a live show as far as a, a instead of a premiere like this episode is. It was a live show, live draft show. We watched the first round with you guys for the whole duration of the four hours, whether it, you tuned in for the whole entire thing, joined in uh, for bits and pieces of it. We thank you guys so much for interacting and engaging with us. This was the best viewership that we've had for a live show yet and the best engagement, most engagement that we've had. Michael Watson joined us as a co-host. We thank him for joining us and giving us his insight and helping out with that. But you guys are the real deal for making this thing happen, helping Town of Football improve so much compared to last year's live draft show because that show last year, it kind of sucked. But this year was amazing because of you guys. So thank you guys so much for joining us. And if you're joining us right now, we are premiering this. We're not live, but we're premiering this. So if you guys want to interact with us in the chat, I have the ability to be in the chat with you guys as well. And I can talk with you guys while you guys are just hanging out, watching the show. Let's just talk about football. Let's talk about the NFL draft and all the surprises that happened with it. Uh, I mean, I mean, Trevor Lawrence, we knew that was going to happen. Zach Wilson, we knew that was going to happen. Justin Fields, however, falling outside of the top 10. Do you guys feel like that should happen or he was deserving of that? Let us know your opinions in the chat below, and I'm happy to talk with you guys. Uh, and just, like I said, hang out, talk about football. But if you guys want to listen to us on the go, you have the ability to do that as well. Pull out your iPhone, the podcast app, search for Time to Football, uh, subscribe to us, rate and review, five stars, nothing less, and you can listen to us on the go, whether it be a car ride to work, car ride back home from work, or listen to us at the gym, whatever it may be. Subscribe to us, listen to us on the go. Yeah, the NFL draft full of surprises. We're going to get into that. We're going to recap everything as far as that goes. But first, we want to get into NFL news and notes going around the, the league for this week. I think the biggest news is Aaron Rodgers and the whole Green Bay Packers situation. We're going to have a whole entire segment dedicated to Rodgers and talk about him more in depth. But as of right now, we just want to recap. It was reported by Adam Schefter last week during the NFL draft, the first round right before it, that he's unhappy with the whole situation. And um, we didn't record this part, but our buddy Sean Landry, who's going to be joining us later on in the show, we were talking to him uh, off the record. And he kind of said like, yeah, that whole situation took away from the draft and those young guys and their moments. It did a little bit. We... As a matter of fact, us as well, we were talking about it during the draft. Uh, but we're going to get into that much more later on. But as of right now, Rodgers is not happy with the Green Bay Packers. The Minnesota Vikings were interested. Speaking of Justin Fields, they were interested in Justin Fields. There's a report that came out that the Vikings would have drafted Justin Fields if he fell to number 14. Obviously, they would have not have traded up to get Justin Fields. Did not they didn't have the draft capital. They didn't have a second-round pick. Part of the reason why they traded down. And he would have fallen to number 14. The Vikings would have grabbed him. Instead, the Bears beat him to him three picks earlier, grabbed him at number 11. The New England Patriots were not trying to intentionally draft Mac Jones. Let me clarify. They submitted the pick for Mac Jones. That was on purpose. But at number 15, they had no idea that he was going to be available at number 15. They thought he would have been taken by now. But according to Albert Breer of NFL.com, he came out and said that the Patriots had no intentions of tra of drafting Mac Jones, but if he fell to him, they were going to take him. Improve your quarterback room. And uh, Nike went ahead and submitted that pick and said, hey, Mac Jones, you are now a New England Patriot. You're going to be com uh, competing with Cam Newton for that starting quarterback job. Casey Hayward, the former LA Charger, signed a one-year $4 million deal with the Las Vegas Raiders. So he's going to be playing his former team, the Chargers, twice a year. Juwan James, the newly acquired Denver Bronco, tore his ACL. Oh, man. That sucks. That really does suck. So he's going to be out for the whole 2021 season, but the whole debate 
is whether or not the Broncos should pay him $10 million that he's owed in 2021. They're not obligated to, but people are saying, I can see both sides of it. People are saying, yeah, he's deserving of that because he was training and he was getting ready for his job. So he should get workers' compensation. However, the other side of it is, okay, well, if you're in an accident outside of work, you know, work is not obligated to pay you for that. I'm, and I know it's related to work as well, him training, but I don't know. Leave your comments down below. Do you feel like that he's deserving of at least getting paid in 2021? Or do you feel like that the Denver Broncos are in the right and they shouldn't pay him? I mean, it's a touchy subject. So let us know your thoughts and your opinions. Quinnen Williams, speaking of more injuries, uh, on the other side of the trenches, Quinnen Williams, defensive tackle of the New York Jets, broke a small bone in his foot. Ouch. He is out for 8 to 10 weeks. So it's not that significant. He's going to have to rest it up and let it heal for 2 to 3 months, but I think he'll be fine and he should be back by the start of the season and training camp on top of that as well. The biggest news as far as contracts and signings as far as that goes is everybody and all the teams picking up fifth year options for all these players that were drafted a few years ago. So we know some players that have obviously, or or some teams that have picked up the fifth year options, obviously for some players such as Josh Allen from the Buffalo Bills, Calvin Ridley. Yeah. These guys, you're not going to let them go. Okay. So good guys that you can pretty much think of that are in that window of getting their fifth year option picked up. They got their fifth year option picked up, but we want to name some players that had their fifth year option declined. That is Mike Hughes of the Minnesota Vikings, Taven Bryan of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Sony Michelle of the New England Patriots, Terrell Edmonds of the Pittsburgh Steelers, Hayden Hurst of the Falcons, Rashawn Evans of the Tennessee Titans, and Leighton Vander Esch of the Dallas Cowboys. All of these players had their fifth year options declined, meaning that they're going to become unrestricted free agents very, very soon. Do you feel like all these players are deserving of getting their fifth-year options picked up? I mean, just reading off the list, I could see why you would. I I could make a case for all these players why you would decline it. But let us know your thoughts and your opinions down below. Do you feel like these players should stay with their current teams or it's in their best interest to just move on and separate themselves from their current franchise and move on to a new team? Man, we are going to, real quick, turn the background lights to a solid Green Bay Packers colors. We've got some green and gold going on because we want to talk about Aaron Rodgers. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The news has come out, according to Adam Schefter, that Rodgers is disgruntled with the situation with the Packers. Now, a lot of that, it might have been a long time coming. It might have been because they drafted Jordan Love instead of getting a wide receiver for the Packers, for Aaron Rodgers. It could be a lot of things that we just don't know about. I don't know. But the Packers, what we know as of right now, are trying their best to hold on to Aaron Rodgers, who is not happy and has come out and said, not to the public, not to the media, he would never do that, but people close to Rodgers believe that he is done with the Packers. Shocking stuff. The reigning NFL MVP could be moving on to a different franchise. A lot to unpack here as far as what led to it and where is he going to go next if that were to happen. And is there a possibility that he could retire according to maybe Terry Bradshaw? Oh my gosh. The drama, the tea revolving Terry Bradshaw and Aaron Rodgers. Crazy stuff. Look it up if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about. But Rodgers, okay. What led to this? In our opinion, in our guess. What we know as of right now, last year, Rodgers, <laughs> the Packers were so close to making the Super Bowl. They lost in the NFC Championship game. Now, they were blown out by the San Francisco 49ers, but a lot of that had to be attributed to, okay, you've only got Devontae Adams as a good target, and, and Tanya has stepped up as well. But wide receiver one, who's your wide receiver two? It's not going to be Marquez Valdez-Scantling. That's going to be a solid wide receiver, too. It's not going to be Alan Lazard, even though no matter how bad fantasy football enthusiasts want those two players to go off and they draft them in the late rounds thinking that they're going to be fantasy football draft steals, it's just not going to happen. You need a solid wide receiver, too. 
Now, they signed Devin Funches, who's going to be coming back after he opted out for the COVID-19 season. But is he still a solid wide receiver, too? You still needed some wide receiver help. They went on to take Jordan Love, the heir apparent, to Aaron Rodgers. So instead of saying, okay, we're going to get you help, Rodgers, so we can get over that hump and get into the NFC or get over the NFC championship and into the Super Bowl because you got blown out by the San Francisco 49ers. You could have moved the ball down the field. Your offense was lacking. And a lot of that has to be attributed to the lack of offensive weapons. So if you want offensive weapons, why don't you draft one? Why not just go ahead and get the pieces now to go win the Super Bowl while you have Aaron Rodgers for the next three, four, however long, however many years that you have him under contract? Decided to go down a different direction. Thought about the future. Thought about Jordan Love. I have on this show come out and said that I am opposed to the sitting and waiting rule as far as development of a quarterback goes, but that's their decision. If they like Jordan Love, so be it. Not a knock against Jordan Love. Okay, you denied him a, a wide receiver. Joined on the Pat McAfee show, Aaron Rodgers does. He comes on, he says, okay, it's okay. No big deal. You pass up on it. I mean, my job isn't to coach Jordan Love. That's not my job, but I'm going to be supportive of him. And I hope that he has the best career in the NFL. So he kind of brushed it off. Said, okay, whatever. 2020 comes along. Goes to the NFC Championship. You lose a close game. And I feel like that if they had a solid wide receiver, I know Kevin King was kind of responsible uh, or did his part as far as the defense goes, giving up that uh, last second half or that first half touchdown to Scotty Miller. But people could debate if you had a solid wide receiver that you could have drafted in the previous year's draft. Maybe we could be talking about the Packers being in the Super Bowl and potentially winning the Super Bowl against the Chiefs. I don't know. Could have happened. But that didn't happen. So the lack of wide receiver caught up to them. Now this draft comes along, and before the draft even starts, Aaron Rodgers is disgruntled and is already vocalizing his opinions. Okay, well at that point, you'd you'd expect the Packers, okay, this is so last minute, this is the day of the draft. We want to make everything work. We want Aaron Rodgers to be here. we got to take a wide receiver. We've got to make him happy. Okay, Rashad Bateman was taken a couple years, or a couple picks before that by the Baltimore Ravens. You've got Elijah Moore on the board, okay? You could later on get maybe like Terrace Marshall. Uh, they eventually settled with Amari Rodgers, but in the first round, you didn't make that pick to get a wide receiver for Aaron Rodgers. So I understand where the frustration is coming from for Rodgers. And again, this is all surface level. This is all that we know as NFL fans inside of the NFL community. But as far as the front office, the GMs, and within the organization, there could be many more underlying things that we just do not know about. And we've got to keep track of that. We've got to keep that in mind. So Rodgers is frustrated, and we assume that it could be because of the lack of weapons that they have on offense. So what happens from here on? Does Rodgers continue to play with the Green Bay Packers? Does he continue to advocate for a trade to another NFL franchise? Or does he retire and just move on with his life? Let's look at all of these options. Continues to play with the Green Bay Packers. Likelihood of this happening? As of right now, I'm going to say not likely. I have to be kind of quiet because my roommate is a Packers fan. He could probably hear me. But I'm going to say likely not going to happen. I think the Packers and the Green Bay Packers uh, relationship with Aaron Rodgers, I think it's not going to work out because the Packers are probably playing tough, saying, hey, no one's going to dictate this organization. We're the, the people in charge. We make the decisions. We run things around here. You can sit if you want, but hey, we're going to stay on our ground. Okay, cool. Aaron Rodgers could say like, all right, I'm going to sit. Kind of like what the Cincinnati Bengals did with Carson Palmer, where he came out and said before the draft, hey, I don't like my chances here or playing with the Bengals. I don't like my opportunities here. I want to move on to another NFL franchise. And at that point, Palmer's play was starting to decline a little bit with the Cincinnati Bengals. He threw 20 interceptions that year. So they went ahead and drafted Andy Dalton and Palmer just continued to sit. They were thinking ahead to the future in that NFL draft. Palmer continued to sit. And eventually he was traded like weeks into the 2011 season 
to the uh, back then Oakland Raiders. But for Rodgers, this could happen. Same situation could happen. Could sit, could stand his ground, doesn't have to play, might get fined. Okay, he's got a lot of money. Pay that up. So what? I want to get traded. I'm not playing. (laughs) I'll pay the fine, whatever it is. I'm just not playing. Just trade me. It's going to be better for everybody. So I think likely that's what's going to happen with Aaron Rodgers. Now, the teams that could trade him could be the, uh, or could trade for him, the Denver Broncos have been in the discussion. I, I think we got a report during the NFL draft. I don't know how reliable this is, but people are saying that sources are saying that the Broncos and the Green Bay Packers are close to getting a pretty much done deal for Aaron Rodgers. And that could be like three first round picks. I don't know. But the Denver Broncos have been in the talks of being that option for Aaron Rodgers. And the San Francisco 49ers as well, Kyle Shanahan made a phone call to Matt LaFleur, said, hey, before the NFL draft, we just want to know, is Aaron Rodgers available? They said, no, we're not trading him. So people thought like when the Broncos took Patrick Sertan at pick number nine instead of a quarterback, they were thinking to themselves, oh, okay, that's probably because that pretty much tells us that Green Bay Packers and Denver Broncos trading Aaron Rodgers is a done deal. You're just getting a defensive player. The Packers are like, hey, just trade or draft someone else. We'll get you Aaron Rodgers. You've got a quarterback. Don't worry about that. So far, so yet, yeah, hasn't happened. The Las Vegas Raiders are also in the conversation of getting Aaron Rodgers, which would be pretty freaking cool to see. The New Orleans Saints as well have had ties with Aaron Rodgers, so there's endless possibilities uh, of where Aaron Rodgers could go. But I feel like at this point, it might be too far gone. Rodgers might just move on. And if people close to him are saying that he's done with the Green Bay Packers and he's not going to play another down, I believe it. I really do. And I think Rodgers is going to move on to another NFL team. I don't think he's going to retire at this point. I, I This is according to multiple sources, including uh, AJ Hawk, who comes on the Pack McAfee show, who is a former Green Bay Packer, probably has some sort of connection with Aaron Rodgers. He says there's 0% chance that he's going to retire. So I believe that. So I think that the Green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers are done, and he's going to get traded. Which team? I don't know. Leave your comments. Leave your thoughts. What do you think is going to happen with Aaron Rodgers and his future in the NFL? Crazy stuff, man. Crazy stuff. We're going to go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and change these. Lights to white real quick. Man. The draft and Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers and everything. We're now going to be transitioning into recapping the NFL draft that happened this past week. And to help us out with all of that, we've got Time to Football's own film analyst, Jordan Thomas. Jordan, how you doing, my man? Man, I'm doing great. Just had the draft. Got to see all these great players come off the board that we've been looking at for the last two or three months here, really analyzing since last year's football, college football season ended. So I'm just ready to jump into it. Yeah, this past draft, it was a lot of surprises that happened. A lot of players that were taken in later rounds and we expected a lot of teams overdrafted for some players as well. But we want to talk about those players that were the best values for those NFL teams. And we want to talk about those biggest draft steals that happened this past week. Who are some big draft steals from the NFL draft? I think first we have to start with Jeremiah Awotu Koromoa. Went in the second round to the Browns with a 52nd pick. This guy was the was an All-American last year, playing in the ACC against guys like Trevor Lawrence and playing against North Carolina in that high-powered offense as well. And he really dominated there. He was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year. Play sideline to sideline. We'll cover all positions, whether that's tight end, slot receivers, running backs. I think it just doesn't make sense for how he was passed up on when in reality, he's not that big of a difference in terms of skill set from Micah Parsons. Micah Parsons went number 12 to the Cowboys and Awosu Koromoa went 40 picks later. I don't think the talent gap is that large when it comes to these two linebackers. It's crazy to think 40 picks later. Uh, Yeah, he definitely was a biggest steal, especially for someone that read a lot of mock drafts. You saw that uh, a lot of people like Daniel Jeremiah and Mel Kuyper had them ranked in that 15 to 20 range as far as not Mm -hmm. just 
linebackers, but best players overall. Do you know why he just fell so late to the Browns? It's a great question. One thing that jumps out to me is when we're talking about Micah Parsons, he's 6'3", around 245. When you look at Owosu Koromoa, he's more along 6'1", 220. So he's given up about 25 pounds, and teams might see him as more of a tweener. And granted, he will come and hit you. Hit you. He lays the wood in the running game, but it's a, a, it's a, a robber position. I'm, I'm looking for that term. He fits between safety and a linebacker, more of the robber there, and they might not see him as a true linebacker uh, for a Wosu Koromo. I think that's why a lot of teams passed up on him. Yeah, I mean, makes a lot of sense for some NFL teams and not really fitting the needs that they have. So Owusu Koromoa is your biggest draft steal, your first one at least on your list. Who's another one? So I've got two safeties that I want to talk about. First is Andre Sisco. Went to Syracuse, had his season cut cut short last year due to a torn ACL. But this guy led the FBS in interceptions during his freshman year with seven INTs. And let's just start here. Career-wise, he had 24 games, 13 interceptions. To say that he's a ball hawk would be an understatement. He's also very physical in the run game. Had 130 tackles during that time frame as well. So I think this is going to be a steal. You'll see the title boom or bust next to him, but I really think he's more boom than bust. And you were talking about Daniel Jeremiah. Bucky Brooks actually had Andros, Andre Sisco right behind the top two safeties um, in this draft. So he's right up there uh, behind Moreg and, and, and also the, the safety out of Oregon as well. So it's going to be good to see what Andre Sisco does. Not Holland. He's not. He's not Moreg as well, but I think he's right there if you need a playmaker. Yeah, absolutely. So Cisco, definitely one of your biggest draft steals by the Jacksonville Jaguars. Mm -hmm. You've got one more on your list. Who is it? Yep. And thanks for the correction. So Cisco went in the third round to the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I thought that was a little bit late for him when he was only behind Merrick and Holland, at least in terms of where I perceive him. Third on my list would be Jamar Johnson. So I said I had two safeties. Jamar Johnson's the second one. So he was a safety out of Indiana, the 20th pick in the fifth round to the Broncos. This guy had seven interceptions and a little bit over 400 coverage snaps. So what does that mean? Let's think. If you play a college season and it's at least 10 games, every game you're going to have about 50 snaps uh, that it's going to take place on defense. If you play that, that's 500 snaps. This guy had seven picks in 400. So didn't have a lot of experience, didn't start his freshman year at Indiana. And I think that's why he dropped so far. Also, he played corner in 2019 for Indiana. And then he played safety door in 2020, had a great year, actually intercepted Justin Fields twice. And if you look at NFL.com, ESPN, they both have Johnson rated in their top five amongst all safeties. I was even watching a video on Pro Football Focus about Jamar, and they had him possibly going in the first round. So for this guy to drop all the way to the fifth, I think it's going to be a great value pickup for the Broncos, and I look forward to seeing what he does in the pros. Absolutely. So we move from the biggest draft steals into teams that have improved the most. So this could be based off of the teams that got those biggest draft steals or just in general. Following the 2021 NFL draft, in your opinion, which do you feel like or which NFL franchise do you feel like improved the most? I've got to start with this Chargers. So they obviously want to build around Justin Herbert. They have that young quarterback. First thing they did is they went out and they got a mauler in Rashawn Slater. This guy sat out the 2020 season. year before that, didn't allow any sacks, only one hit on the QB. So they have someone that, that really can get it done up front. He also is very versatile. You can play him at tackle, guard, center. He can play every position on the offensive line. So you, you have to be excited about that. Also is very athletic. I think Panay Sewell uh, did a better job in getting to the second level, but Slater is right there. You see him all the time reaching out to linebackers and, and, and just constantly – being a, a nuisance to defenders. Next up, they got Asante Samuel Jr., who I was just talking about. 
this is a pros pro. His dad played in the pros, Patriots, Eagles, et cetera. He played very well at Florida State. Didn't give up more than 200 yards all of last season. I, that's unheard of. And also had – always was getting his hands on the ball. Had more than 20 pass deflections there too. Great hip movement, great footwork. Just, just a very fundamental player. Chargers got Josh Palmer in the third round. Wide receiver out of Tennessee. Didn't have huge production. So his best season – Last year, had about 475 yards, four touchdowns. That doesn't sound like the numbers of a, of a big-time pro receiver. However, he, he's got the intangibles. When you look at how he adjusts the football, whether it's a sideline catch or it's in the end zone, he can do that. And, I, and if anyone can maximize his talent and get him the ball, it's going to be Justin Herbert. We saw what he did last year. I think he's going to get the most out of Palmer. Chris Rump the second. This guy fell to the middle of the fourth round, but once again, similar to when you're looking at a Jamar Johnson, who should have went higher in a draft as a safety, the same was the case with Chris Rump. So he was top five as an outside linebacker on ESPN. He's, he's been looked at as an edge rusher, so he's not always considered a linebacker. And even in that category, he's got to be at least in your top 10, constantly getting after the quarterback. Last two seasons, he had over... 10 plus tackles for loss, had 14 and a half sacks over the last two seasons as well. This guy can get after the quarterback. He fell because could be a tweener. Whenever scouts in NFL aficionados cannot clearly, clearly define what you're going to be, that's when you tend to fall in a draft. And that happened with, with this case. Next up in the, in the sixth and seventh rounds, I think the Chargers did a great job of, of addressing special teams. They were one of the worst units, not just last year, but in NFL history when it comes to opposing uh, field position for their opponent there. So got to do a better job there. They got Nick Neiman, a linebacker out of Iowa, and also Mark Webb, who played at Georgia. I think those can both be significant contributors for special teams for the Chargers. So that's my first team that I think did a great job, and they're going to be a lot better next year because of all the value they found throughout the draft. I like what the LA Chargers did a lot. And you talked about the first two picks, uh, especially Rashawn Slater. The fact that he fell out of the top 10 where many mock drafts had him going uh, to maybe like number eight to the Carolina Panthers, or at least somewhere in that top mm -hmm. 10, even some people saying that he's better than Panay Sewell. And then Asante Samuel on some mock drafts was creeping into that first round, late first round territory. And for the Chargers to get him in the second round is a big steal as well. So the Chargers, your first team. Who's your next team? Jets. J-E-T-S. Jets, Jets, Jets. So we talked about Justin Herbert for the Chargers, and I'm getting their quarterback last year. Well, the Jets are getting their quarterback this year, and they did that with Zach Wilson. I think he can be someone that's very good at being mobile outside the pocket. So, a lot, and, and let me back up. A lot of folks want to know, how can Zach Wilson be successful, especially with the Jets? Didn't look very good on offense. They haven't been a team that's been able to even protect the quarterback very well, whether that was Joe Flacco or whether that was Sam Darnold. So I think Zach Wilson being someone who can move outside of the pocket and make throws on a, on a run is going to be great. Him also getting the ball out of his hands very quickly is going to be an asset. And then him having anticipation. So many quarterbacks want to wait until a receiver gets open. Well, within the NFL, you don't have that time. You don't have that leeway with elite defenders. So Zach Wilson can do all those things. I like that for his intangibles. I compare him to Ryan Fitzpatrick, that fire, that edge. He plays with that. But from a, kill, a skill set perspective, he has that Russell Wilson in him. He has that anticipation. He has that great deep ball throw. He has that polish um, that you see in his game. Next up, the Jets got... Elijah Vera Tucker. So you got to protect your asset. You got to protect the quarterback at all times. And so they get Vera Tucker at 14. Slater went one pick ahead with the Chargers. It's interesting to, to know or think about what the Jets have got Slater instead, if they could have. We'll never know for sure. But Vera Tucker, I think he's right up there, a notch behind both Panay Sewell and Vera Tucker. And, uh, and, and also Slater, but Vera Tucker's right there. This guy, once he gets his, his hands on you, you're done. You're finished. Uh, he also is able to move from tackle to guard as well. 
So it shows that versatility. Next up, they got another Elijah, and Elijah Moore went early in the second round there. I think that's going to be great for them. I talked about how Zach Wilson is going to need to get the ball out of his hands quickly. Well, Elijah Moore is someone who can make a lot happen, even if he's catching out of the backfield. If that's going to be on a wheel route, if that's going to be a screen, he can make plays at the line of scrimmage and take it, take it 20, 25 yards. He can make plays going across the field on slants or drag routes. He also can run the go route as well because he's super fast. Uh, on top of that, he's got excellent hands. So a very, very good wide receiver, I think, is going to, to really do well there for the Jets. Michael Carter is a guy that they got in the fourth round. This dude had over 1,000 yards in his junior year, had over 1,200 yards in his senior year. Um, and is someone that can play a role in a kick return game and a receiving receiving game. He actually led the, the league, led the FBS last year for yards per rush with 7.98, almost eight yards per carry. That's crazy to think about. I think he'll be an asset out of the backfield, line him up with a slot receiver once again with special teams. They also were able to get Jason Pinnock in the fifth round. This guy was a corner from Pittsburgh and led his team interceptions with three. That's good value when you're talking about the fifth round. So that's going to be an asset. And then last but not least, you get Hamza Nasruddin, safety out of FSU. So we talked about the safeties before and getting value late or, or down later in, in what your list would be for safeties. I think you're going to get that with Nasruddin. 6'3", 215, and someone that's going to be an impact in the run game and also can stick with receivers. He... Well, he can use some help in coverage. I'll say that he's not – you can scratch out, stick with the receivers per se. He's going to be someone that more so is going to be in that front seven in the box being helper there, and he's going to have to improve with his coverage skills. But still, great pick when you're looking at the sixth round. I think that's going to play, pay dividends for the Jets and their depth. Yeah, Nazardine, a pretty cool story that I saw was uh, he used to play basketball, and uh, he was very good at dunking in high school. So – the fans, the students of the opposing team would actually go up to him and say, hey, this player on my team, make sure you dunk on him. I don't know whether they hated that player or what. They just knew that he was amazing at dunking. So, uh, yeah, but the Jets, heavy offense, offensive picks uh, pretty early on. You saw that Zach Wilson, number two, that was pretty obvious from the start what they were going to do once they traded Darnold. And then – you just make them into an investment and you add in weapons and free agency like Tevin Coleman and Corey Davis. Now you got Elijah Moore to pair up with Corey Davis. And then Michael Carter, like you said, is going to be a dark horse in the running game to pair up with Tevin Coleman. So I like what they did and to protect Zach Wilson as well with Elijah Vera Tucker. Uh, so we talked about the jets. Now you've got one more team that improved after the NFL draft. Who is it? Yes. It was the Miami Dolphins. And granted, there were tons of teams that thought they well. Vikings, the Falcons. There were some teams that really did a great job of staying where they were at and, and getting better on both sides of the ball. Speaking about both sides of the ball, I think the Dolphins did that. Because you've got a young quarterback in Tua tunga Bailoa. You wanted to get him some weapons. I think you did that with Jalen Waddell. At the top of the draft, these receivers were all elite, or, or at least that was our analysis coming out. I, I would believe so, whether you're talking Devontae Smith, Jamar Chase, or, of course, Kyle Pitts. They get Waddle, a guy who averaged 21 yards per catch. His worst game outside of the national championship, because, of course, we all know he was hurt in that national championship. So his worst game outside of that was six catches for 120 yards against Ole Miss. I mean, that's crazy to even think about. He's also someone that can, can be a threat in the return game, can be a threat coming out of the backfield all in, in the rounds. Very easy to get him the ball and just watch him, watch him go after that. Next up, they got Jalen Phillips on the defensive side of the ball. This guy came out of Miami. He first attended UCLA in 2017-2018, had some injuries, ankle, wrist, concussions, and thought that he was not going to be able to continue his career. Had the ability to transfer to Miami in 2019, set out that season and played in 2020, had a big time season there. And, and that's ultimately what got him picked 18th in, in, in the draft to the Dolphins. Eight sacks last year, 15 and a half tackles for loss. This guy is 6'6", 260. I want to see what he can do at the next level. And that should definitely aid their pass rush. Now, 
they moved on and got some help in the secondary. So go back two levels from the defensive line and you get Javon Holland. This guy, 27 career games, nine interceptions, can also play a returner. Very, very polished. Someone that can cover slot receivers. And the question might be, what separates the first two safeties from the rest of the pack? Because I talked about my guys who I think are going to be steals. Well, what really separates these guys like Trayvon Moreg and also Javon Holland from the rest is how good they are in coverage, whether it's slot receivers, running backs. They can run toe-to-toe with a lot of guys. Where they need help at is in tackling and in, in the run game. And I think you'll want to see Javon Holland improve there, but definitely a playmaker, and, a, and it would be great to see him play with the opportunistic defense like the Dolphins. We saw Mika Fitzpatrick was able to do and put up those huge numbers. Holland should fit in that same mold. Next up, they get Liam Eichenberg in the second round, 10th pick. Some scouts, some analysts had this guy as top five, top six in their in their, in their tackles. They also thought he might go in the first round, very early pick in the second round. He did not give up a sack after week five of 2018. Wow. So, yeah, he played in 2019. He he wasn't like one of these guys that opted out in 2020. He played. He did not give up any sacks after week five in 2018. Also, Notre Dame played Clemson in a Cotton Bowl in 2018. He did not give up a sack in that game against Clemson. Clemson had a very good front seven in 2018. So it, it just goes to show how good this player was and the value that the Dolphins were able to get at this position. Hunter Long was my next guy who the Dolphins secured in the third round, went to Boston College, had more catches than Kyle Pitts last year, very shorthanded. Weak spot was not a good blocker. And, um, and of course, we're starting to see the NFL value pass catchers and tight ends that are able to do that more and more, right? They're not blocking. They don't have their – they're not always down on the line of scrimmage. Sometimes they're going to be lined out wide, right? Hunter Long is a guy that can do that. He can – make catches in the ends in the red zone, great red zone threat there and can get first downs. I think I saw a stat like 60% of his catches last year resulted in first downs. So this guy can move the sticks. He can score touchdowns and is going to be once again, somebody that can help out a young quarterback like Tua and be a safety net there. So I like Hunter Long and overall, I like what the Dolphins were able to do in the draft to improve their team. Yeah, it seems like ever since Brian Flores and this new regime came into town, they've done everything possible to help improve this team and turn this team around. We all know that whenever a team is under the reins of Adam Gase, it doesn't look great at all. But <laughs> uh, so you can't improve that much, but or you can't you don't have to try enough to to make it improve. But uh, I love what Brian Flores is doing with uh, changing the whole franchise around and really finessing trading down, but then trading back up and getting an extra first round pick in the future out of that as well. Uh, but those are your top three teams from Jordan Thomas, courtesy of him, that have improved the most in the NFL draft. Jordan, it's always a pleasure to have you on, and I can't wait to have you on again for future episodes. Hassan, thank you. And I love being on Time to Football. Anything that I can do, I'm more than happy to, to come out, help, and lend my expertise. That is Jordan Thomas, ladies and gentlemen. Great conversation with Jordan Thomas. Glad to always have him on this episode of Time to Football. I'm actually going to change the background lights right now to a little bit of gold because we're going to bring on a very loyal Saints fan, and that is Sean Landry making his debut on Time to Football. Sean, I appreciate you joining us for this episode of Time to Football. We got to talk about the NFL draft and preferably we got to be talking about the saints before we get into the specifics as far as like the names and who you guys got if you had to give just a grade right now for the saints Mm -hmm. and their Mm -hmm. nfl draft what would it be well first of all thank you for having me uh who that represent very strong very proud for all those loyal members of who that nation uh the grade i'd give them honestly um and and i'm gonna be blunt I'm going to give him a C minus. Uh, the reason why I'm giving him a C minus is just because, you know, we lost so much uh, talent after the season. And obviously with trying to get under the cap, granted, we were experiencing a pandemic like many teams were. 
uh, you know, we had a lot of uh, let a lot of good talent go. You know, the Trey Hendricksons of the world, the Janoris Jenkins of the world, uh, Manuel Sanders. So there were so many different holes uh, that we could have filled. And I felt like, based from what I was reading, all the mock drafts leading up to uh, last Thursday, uh, corner I felt like was the top need. And actually, the day of the draft, I was reading um, reports that we were going to try to work our way up into the top ten. Uh, and you know, just very very. Uh, small whispers of it, and then lo and behold, you know, draft draft night goes on. You see, we set we sit at twenty eight. <clears throat> so, um, you know, we didn't draft a corner to the third round, I believe. And so, you know, sometimes getting the guys in the later rounds actually pay bigger dividends than those you draft in the first round. And uh, so, I'd give us a D, just or a C minus rather, going into that D uh, grading area, just because I felt like we could have done more. The Saints should have done more. Um, and made bold moves just because a lot of the teams are making bold moves, you know, going into the off season, going into the draft preparations, things of that nature, because, you know, a lot of teams have this must win now mentality, not, you know, we can't just wait and rebuild three, four years and, and expect uh, to achieve greatness. So uh, the grade I'd give them, it would be a, about a C minus, but I, I like some of the picks we got, you know, obviously uh, the Pete Warner pick, you know, that goes back to Sean, like Ohio state players, um, so, you know, there are, there are some ties to that, but I'd give them a C minus if I had to be honest with you. Wow. Very blunt. And I like that because that shows that you're a little bit unbiased and you're just seeing it how it is. Um, mm-hmm. And and kind of talking about the draft picks and uh, who you specifically pick the New Orleans Saints organization. I think mm-hmm. first off, we have to talk about the first round pick because that caught a lot of people off guard. Mm-hmm. Peyton Turner. What mm-hmm. was up with that? So uh, that surprised me too, but then again, it didn't surprise me. You know, uh, if I had to choose at the end of the off season this year, who to keep and who to, who to cut, I really was hoping we would keep Trey Hendrickson just because he was an unnatural talent that nobody knew when he was coming out of the 2017 draft, you know, when we had that great draft class of him and Kamara uh, to name a few. And so I feel like, again, we didn't move up in the top 10. I was hoping we would to draft a corner, uh, when I learned that J.C. Horn's dad is uh, former Saint great Joe Horn, I was like, cool, that'd be awesome to have his kid come come home and play for his dad's old club. Uh, so I was really hoping we'd get a corner. But uh, when we drafted Peyton Turner, yeah, the same thing we touched on earlier in the week was what was up with that? And, and I felt like for two reasons, you know, the first the first thing is corner was our biggest need. But the second reason is you extended Marcus Davenport's fifth year option, which I, I hate to say it. I kind of feel like he's leaning more a little towards that bust uh, title uh, just because he can't stay healthy and he really hasn't been able to push off the line, so to speak. So uh, hopefully Peyton is a rotational player. That's probably what he'll end up doing to start the year uh, or start his career rather is be that rotational player. But then I'm hearing whispers that they're going to try to build him long term, you know, because eventually Cam Jordan's greatness is going to have to come to an end as well. So um I'm a little surprised by the pick, but then again, you know, only time will tell um, whether or not he's going to be a really great saint for many years to come, or he's going to be one of those guys that's going to be out of the door in in two to three years. Yeah, so it makes a lot of sense when you put it in perspective as far as Trey Hendrickson, they lost to the Bengals. Cam Jordan, obviously, like you said, can't be great forever. Marcus Davenport as well is, you know, like you said, could be leaning towards that bus category, which is kind of unfortunate because they traded up for him. So do you feel like that they chose a defensive end like Peyton Turner uh, because they were leaning towards like the defensive line was going in that direction? And if so, why would you choose Peyton Turner over maybe someone like Gregory Rousseau, who was highly touted as a better defensive end or a better edge rusher in many mock drafts? Yeah. Well, I know you had uh, Penn State's, what's his, I can't remember his first name. His last name is like Awe. Jason I know you Owe. Had, yeah, you had Jason Owe as our first pick uh, just because, I mean, Sean likes drafting guys. Him and Mickey both like drafting guys who can get after the quarterback. You've seen it in years past with David Onyemata. You've seen it with Cam Jordan. You've seen it with Sheldon Rankins, uh, especially when we like na- knocking Matt Ryan on his on his keister every now and then. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know what – persuaded him persuaded them rather to draft him i mean he was the i think going into the draft he was 106th best player on the board 
And so maybe they felt like other teams would go up there and snag him before they did. And maybe that's why they, they got him with the first overall pick as a toes, as opposed to waiting in the later rounds and getting him then. Um, but again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You know, if, if Marcus, Marcus Davenport doesn't pan out this year, and obviously Cam Jordan uh, is getting a little bit up there in age, I mean, you're going to have to get a guy that, that has that speed and is going to be able to get the quarterback, you know, off his off his feet every now and then. But then I also know that he's had he's had injury uh, concerns in, at Houston in his college career. So, all, again, only time will tell whether or not he's going to be a, a great for a long time or, again, he's going to be out in a couple of years like most most players are. And a player that we may have to see that could also be a great or maybe out of the league in, in a few years would be Ian Book, taken by the Saints. Now, a lot of people are talking about, okay, Drew Brees retired, bring in a quarterback, draft a quarterback. Sean, talk to me about Ian Book. Uh, well, I kind of feel like he may end up being the, the steal in the, in the second tier of quarterbacks. I know, yeah, I know he's kind of considered maybe the third tier, you know, third and fourth tier, but I really felt like he should, maybe should have gone earlier. Um, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Kellen Mond. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of faith in, in Kyle Trask. I mean, they had they linked us to drafting Kyle Trask in the later rounds, and I think he's going to be a glorified backup. I really don't think he'll he'll be a starter uh, out there in Tampa. Uh, but going back to Ian Book, so I actually, right before uh, you had me on, I actually did a little bit compare and contrast because, you know, Ian Book is the all-time winningest quarterback in Notre Dame history. And I compared him to, to another Notre Dame great, Brady Quinn, uh, who, you know, Back in 07, Brady was supposed to be a top five pick. Obviously, we saw he fell all the way to the, to the lower 20s, and Cleveland brought him home, uh, which he never really uh, translated his game at the pro re- the pro level. Excuse me. Um, so, with Ian, you know, I compared his stats to Brady's, and he had, both of both Brady and Ian had similar stats their junior year of college at Notre Dame, um, but Ian, on the other hand, had an overall best uh, percentage. Then Brady Brady had a 134 quarterback rating through four years at Notre Dame, whereas uh, Ian had 147 uh, quarterback rating at all four years at Notre Dame. He's got a, he's he's got flashy feet. Uh, he can make plays out of the po- outside of the pocket, which if you've known now, that's a trend in the NFL. A lot of quarterbacks are able to make more plays out of the pocket than in. And uh, again, he's he's a six foot less quarterback, you know, so he's he's built similarly to Drew style. So. Uh, but we've shown time and time again, you know, with Teddy and with Taysom that Sean can make something out of nothing and he can really help bring out the full potential in quarterbacks that a lot of teams may or may not be familiar with. So, again, only time will tell. I think he'll he'll be a third string going this year. You know, obviously it's going to be Jace, Jameis and Taysom in the uh, offseason competing for the starting role. You know, whoever loses that battle will be the backup. But uh, we all know that. Sean likes to incorporate Taysom in, in various packages, so Ian may move up to a backup role uh, at that point. But, uh, again, only time will tell whether or not he can be great. I mean, look at Tom, for example. Tom went in the sixth round, and 20 years later in seven Super Bowls, you know, is now one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. So, again, it goes back to the draft. You know, you find you find a lot of rarity um, in the later rounds, and, and – those oftentimes pay huger dividends than quarterbacks you draft in the first round. I mean, you, you've seen it so far with Kyler and with Lamar and Deshaun, but you look at the guys like the Sam Darnolds of the world, the Josh Rosens of the world, the Mr. Biskies of the world, you know, they, they haven't panned out as great as quarterbacks in the later rounds, you know, like Garoppolo, for example, when he's healthy uh, to really show you what you have going forward in the long run. And if Ian book is their guy, that's, their guy that's a prerogative if they feel like like you said is going to be uh a third string is he going to move up into back of role if Taysom Hill is going to work in different packages but it's an interesting decision from Sean Payton and the whole Saints organization that at the second round pick that they had they took Pete Werner which good player Mm -hmm. but then later on you had Kyle Trask getting taken by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers at the end of that round then you had Kellen Mond, you had Davis Mills, and all these other quarterbacks were being taken. Do you feel like that the Saints at that point were like, oh man, we regret not taking Kyle Trask, uh, who there was rumors out there that he was very well liked by the New Orleans Saints. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. even Davis Mills and Kellen Mond that many other analysts ranked mm-hmm. higher than Ian Book. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, in truth be told, all three of those guys were on our mock drafts um, 
leading up to last week. But I just kind of feel, you know, Kyle had one good year at Florida, and that's no knock on on him as a, as a professional athlete. You know, he's I'm sure he'll do well in the NFL. But you know, you look at him, and I talked to a friend of mine the other day. I said, you know, look at him in the Cotton Bowl. He did really well throughout his full year. And granted, it was a weird 2020 was a weird year for all college teams, and Florida had a really good year last year. Uh, and that's why he was able to, statistically speaking, do very well. But leading up to the Cotton Bowl, you take away Kyle Pitts, you, you take away Kadarius Tony, you take away your starting running back, and what are you? He really couldn't make the other guys around him better. He couldn't elevate the other guys around him better. And just that's just for an example. Um, I really didn't expect us to take a quarterback. You know, honestly, Sean has said ever, ever since Drew announced he was he wasn't coming back that he felt good with with. Taysom and Jameis going forward um he felt like both guys had a uh, a conviction about them to really take the reins uh and really elevate the Saints to the next level that we've been missing the last four years in the postseason um but then again maybe Ian maybe there was something about Ian that caused him to not go earlier than than you know the fourth round um but I, I really hope he does well. I really, I'd really like to see what he does. Um, you know, I definitely will tell you it'll make the quarterback competition interesting next year because Taysom and Jameis are on one-year prove-it deals this year. Um, so if both guys don't really spark an excitement within the fan base, within the organization, and Jameis ends up going elsewhere next year and, and Taysom does the same, I mean, you could be looking at, at Ian Book being the starter moving forward. But again, uh, only time will tell. It's it's really too early to crown crown him uh, and his success without seeing how he's gonna how he's gonna do uh, when the lights are bright and especially in preseason as well. How he's gonna react when he's got bigger, stronger, faster guys coming after him as opposed to those in college. Well, only time will tell. Maybe Sean Payton pulls something together and gets that whole roster uh, back to back to glory in the in the playoffs again. But Sean, appreciate your insight and thank you so much for joining us for the show and. We hope to have you for many more episodes in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, you know, like I said, I look forward to being on here if, if given another shot at it. And that was Sean Landry giving us his take on the New Orleans Saints and their draft picks. But that'll do it for this week's episode of Time to Football. Listen, before you guys sign off, let me just say this. From May until August, there's not a lot going on with the NFL. But we're going to bring you the NFL content every single Thursday. I know you're going to be deprived of football, but we're going to bring you content. We're going to bring you news. We're going to bring you debates. And on top of that, we're going to bring you fantasy football coverage. That's right. We're back to creating the spreadsheets and analyzing everything, all the team rosters with all their acquisitions with the free agents and the draft picks. And we're going to create all these fantasy football stats and projections that we're going to give you guys Every single week, so make sure you guys subscribe to this channel so you can stay up to date with all of that. I'm telling you, it's going to be amazing because if you stay tuned from May through August, you'll be ready, 100% ready for fantasy football season, and it's going to be lots of fun. Interact with us. Let us know your opinions as well. So subscribe to this channel so you can stay up to date with all of that, or you can listen to us on the go. Like I said, pull out the podcast app on your phone, search for Time to Football, rate and review, subscribe to us, listen to us on the go. With all that said, thank you guys so much for tuning in and watching this episode or listening to this episode of Time to Football, and I'll see you next week. Take care.